For Halloween this year, I decided to try recreating a garment that after exactly three decades is still as popular if not more than ever. The iconic lace dress from Vivian Westwood's fall 1993 collection, Anglomania. Because it's gothic and that's spooky. And you can't spell Shalloween without Halloween. But seriously, is anything scarier than trying to reverse engineer a vintage lace dress with only Google images for reference? Of course, research would either make or break this project, so like a confused but fashion-conscious creature gathering for winter, I scoured the web for any and every decent image of this millennial dress. The first pattern was for the yoke of the dress, knit from the top down. Closer inspection led me to the conclusion that this garment was at least partly machine knit, so that was a whole other thing to contend with. But I digress, this pattern was an ever-growing leaf stitch with leaves that branched out and cascaded diagonally from each stem to form what I'd like to describe as the wardrobe of Poison Ivy's goth sister, Weeping Willow. <laughs> I didn't have a pattern for this one, but I did manage to find a lace stitch with the same increases, so that helped a lot. And now I've made a mess, so I think I'm just gonna restart. I do need to make some changes, but otherwise, I'm really pleased with it. I just need to make sure that it's the right gauge. So according to the references I have, these leaves are a bit too wide, because if I double these up, they end up over here, but they should be ending up somewhere around here. Despite the original dress being made from 100% alpaca according to the photograph labels, I figured I'd use cotton yarn, of which I had both white and black, but no cream. This was actually mostly because I preferred the crisp cotton stitch definition to the softer fuzzier alpaca, and if you're sensing any danger, you're not wrong, and I'll explain shortly. Despite swatching in white, I was leaning more towards the black, because apart from it clearly being the people's choice, it felt more fitting for the occasion. Miss Havisham may have objected, and to be fair, she was a sustainability queen, but I felt like black was more versatile. Sounds cute. Might delete later. Obviously, I had no idea what the weight or tension of the original yarn was, let alone the size of needle required, so my best guess was that it was a 4-ply yarn using somewhere between 2.5 and 3.5 millimeter size needles. Of course, it was awfully convenient that this description perfectly fit my yarn. I think it's looking okay. I did eventually make some progress, but there was still a lot of refinement needed, and before I knew it, the true weight of repeating a design mistake squashed my soul over and over again like a hydraulic press video compilation, and I realised yet again that mistakes were simply not an option. Next, I tackled the simplest pattern out of the three, and that was a diamond lace with alternating pearl and lace columns separating each zigzag column. This was easier to figure out in the sense that I found what looked to be similar if not the same stitch patterns, so all I had to do was put them together with the right numbers, which was the hardest part, but it was okay. Weirdly enough, even though it's simpler, I am finding it a little more difficult than the leaf pattern, mostly because it's so repetitive it's really easy to lose track of where I am, but it is getting better, and the first zigzag diamond is a bit dodgy, but the second one is how I want it to be. I would make a larger sample given the opportunity again, but I was obviously too excited to spare the patience. These are the zigzags I started off with, but I ended up making everything a bit narrower as I went, and I've just started making increases to get that frilled hem, but I've realised I've probably made them the wrong way around in the centre, so I think I'm going to switch those, but other than that, I think it's looking okay. To cast off, I looked into how to make a pico hem, since it's what the original dress finished every edge off with, so I started with the most common pico cast off, which didn't look great because it was my first attempt and I conveniently forgot to record it. I then tried the other version, which involved wrapping the yarn, and this is what it looked like. On second thoughts, it's too tidy, and it doesn't really hang the way I want it to. The edges on the original seemed a little more frilled, I guess. But yeah, I'm going to try the other one and see how it looks in comparison. Things were looking much better the second, or rather third time around, and despite feeling a little silly for flip-flopping this much, the certainty certainly made up for it. I feel like this is more accurate. The last one, for now, was a frost flower lace stitch, which I eventually discovered after a long-winded search. 
A bit like spending years looking for Richard III, only to realise he was buried under a car park the whole time. Not much can be learned from it, but it feels like something should be. Perhaps that it usually is where you think it is, even if you can't see it. Well, we all know that's only half true. This lace was hard to google using descriptive words alone, so I had zero luck with that, and I actually ended up stumbling across it in a book, after which it started showing up everywhere, all over the place and under my mattress. In fact, this stitch pattern has been around for a long time, at least since the Victorian era, which makes a lot of sense with it being a relative staple in Vivian Westwood knits. In case you're wondering, it's blue because I was using scrap yarn, and I just find that cotton is the easiest yarn to learn new things with, because it's quite defined and easy to frog and repurpose. So now that I've done another repeat of this section, I can really see where I went wrong with the first attempt. And by first attempt, it's probably the fifth, but it's also making a lot more sense now, so I'm feeling a bit more confident. And if I place it on my arm, that's basically the pattern for most of the sleeve. Initially, I could barely make out what was going on from the dress, and it just looked like a bunch of spiders doing spidery things. Unsurprisingly, learning how to knit it felt super awkward. Fortunately, this was more to do with my lack of lace experience than the pattern itself, and the sense of satisfaction from finishing this swatch was totally worth it. But still, this one set a whole new bar in terms of just how difficult this project was going to get, and I was shaking in my boots. Nay, gasping in my galoshes, quivering in my corsets, fidgeting in my fishnets. Too far. So to summarise, here were the three lace patterns, or more aptly, the Rosetta Stone for this project, carved under severe sleep deprivation and homebrewed stimulants. Not that it's easy to tell, but I tried placing them where they would end up on the dress, and yeah, this is it, pretty much. Except it totally wasn't. In reality, none of this was meant to be. And here's why. I found out that cotton isn't great for knitting lace. I mean, technically, there was nothing stopping me. And we all know I used cotton for my first lace project, with this being only my second one. But the point is that, generally speaking, animal fibres are the way to go because they have memory, and this helps to maintain the structure of the lace over time. Some have more than others, but plant fibres tend to have less of this overall. So despite having pretty much everything ready to go, I ended up swatching the first pattern again in a wool alpaca blend, which was much closer to the original, although still not exactly the same. I can't tell you how relieved I was to learn this before starting, but the universe… well, you already know. I did change the pattern quite a bit for the wool by lengthening the leaves, so I'm glad that I figured out the lace in cotton, but the wool just has a better drape and stretch in general. Aesthetically, I actually think I prefer the cotton, but it's just too risky. There's even more to this, but it has to be seen to be believed. Trust me. <laughs> now, if you're wondering how I got to the initial cast-on count, I literally counted each stem using separate images and added a two-stitch pearl column in between each one, sandwiching the frost flower lace in the middle. And unless stated otherwise, this was pretty much the approach throughout the entire project. Now the way the original laces draped together on the stand had me sweating, and I feared that what I had done was too simple, too straightforward, but I also felt in my gut that the simplest option was the right one. You may cringe when I tell you that there was no measuring, calculating tension, or anything of the sort other than a severe eyeballing. After all, what real choice did I have? What information was there to go off of, other than looks about right, that'll do, and good enough? It might even send shivers down your spine to learn that the reference images I used were apparently of different dress sizes too. But I will say that flying by the seat of my pants had never felt this exhilarating before, and I was there for it. If you're exhausted at this point, I was near collapse, and I spent half the time in a daze over the fact that I was actually doing this, and it wasn't just one of those dreams where you're gifted with the ability of flying, only to wake up and be reminded that you can't, and never could. I say this because knitting lace was always the ultimate challenge, the holiest of grails, if you catch my drift. If, like me, you're also relatively or even entirely new to knitting lace, it might be of some comfort to you to know that things, so far at least, follow a basic rule, which is that it's all about making a bunch of yarn over increases and then getting rid of them with decreases. So although my first lace project a couple videos ago was only a simple lace pattern, 
is still hammered in the basics, and it's easy to downplay how important that was to approaching this one. Before I knew it, I became obsessed, except the feelings were very much unrequited. The less I could see, the more images I sought out, but the more images I found, the more confusing the garment construction became. It was like being lost in a house of mirrors at a carnival haunted by the ghost of Runway's past. I was meant to increase and form another stem from each of these branches and I forgot to do that so I'm going to have to frog a couple rows to correct it. And... <gasps> okay. The truth was that there were just too many missing pieces to the puzzle and as much as I could sample my bleeding heart out, Halloween was approaching and time was of the essence. That was it. I was properly freehanding this, and slowly embracing the very real possibility of ending up with nothing but a giant, dusty cobweb. Up until now, things were probably as smooth as I could have hoped for, but this was also the calm before the storm, technically speaking, so to say I was apprehensive was an understatement. But at the same time, I had so committed to this with every fibre of my being that I was actually looking forward to approaching the edge of reason just to see how far the fall was. And even though I didn't have the best parachute, by which I mean practice and references, what I did have was still better than nothing. I finally finished the last section of Frost Flower Lace, so I'm going to finish everything off with a Pico cast off to create the cutout. And then I need to figure out how to deal with the armholes. Feeling somewhat confident with the next step, I began casting off the entire frost flower section, and little did I know what I'd gotten myself into. Because this seemed right, it felt right, and there was no conceiving of the possibility that it wasn't. It's not like I had any photos of the original garment to reference or anything. Anyway, with the express goal of not boring you to bits, creating the cutout detailing felt endless. Not only did I try experimenting with the Pico cast off because I thought the gaps were too wide, I eventually realised that my initial cast off was a few stitches too far on either side. I've just realised that I made the cutout too wide and I should have actually stopped it around here. So I'm going to go back and redo everything. Okay. It shouldn't be too bad, it's just the one row. I think. All of which inevitably led to the overworking of the yarn. Proving that you can only frog around so much before something snaps. Oh. The yarn being only half of it. With the fear of history repeating itself, I continued to undo all of my painstaking work stitch by stitch since it was the safest option. And several hours later, it was done. I only hoped that the number of stitches left on the round lined up with a third lace. But before I could find out, it was time to separate the stitches for each armhole. Again, this was tricky because there was no real way to tell for sure how many to slip off on each side, not to mention that everything was mirrored so the mental gymnastics required were nearing Olympic levels. I say this because there were no clear shots of the underarms of this dress, because that would have been weird. So I had to think ahead a lot for this part of the construction. Everything had to line up perfectly for the following lace patterns while also being the right size. Yeah, that one didn't work out. In terms of how I went about this, I just did a lot of counting and referencing swatches, because charting would have taken way too much time and willpower. In other terms, I winged it. I think it's coming together quite well. It is looking a little weird at the moment, but hopefully it is big enough. It might actually be a bit too big, but we'll see. I just have one more row of leaves left after finishing this one, so it should end up roughly where I want it, and the neckline is still bothering me a little, but again, I can only really fix it once I get the collar on. While I continue through the last tier of leaves and begin the transition between laces, let's talk about Anglomania, the collection this dress was a part of. So what does Anglomania actually mean? A quick search defines it as an excessive admiration for English customs, and I kind of knew that already, but I wanted to find out exactly what it meant for Vivian Westwood's Anglomania. And according to the official site, the collection drew inspiration from the French craze for British fashion in the 18th century, so that made a lot more sense. Needless to say, there's a lot of history and subtext involved in explaining the ins and outs of Westwood's Anglomania, 
and although it might help to find an Anglomaniac in the wild to help illuminate things a little more, there was in fact no need, because it turns out that Westwood made her stance quite clear at her London fashion show in support of Scottish independence in 2014. Dame Vivian was quoted saying to reporters that she hated England, explaining that she liked Scotland because somehow she thought they were better, because they were more democratic. Which might even explain the swathes of tartan in this 93 collection, one of which was specially designed by Westwood herself and woven by Loch Caron of Scotland. This particular tartan was also named Mac Andreas, after Andreas Krontala, her husband and design partner, proving that tartan is a love language. Now this part was unexpectedly complex, but only because I had no idea what to expect. That being said, judging from the only chart I had, which was the frost lace that I modified widthways, it looked like the numbers lined up perfectly for the transition into the zigzag lace. And if that really was the case, then it meant that everything else could fall into place a lot more easily than I first thought, rhyming unintended. Although that didn't quell the sneaking suspicion that there were still some underlying increases that my tired eyes couldn't see and my already burdened brain could not predict. Maybe it was just an acute case of what I like to call Perlanoia, the irrational fear of invisible stitches. But of course, it just turned out that I was being Perlanoid, until it suddenly dawned on me that I'd been so swept away with transitioning patterns that I forgot to join the panel edges at the back to form the bottom of the opening which basically meant that I was right to feel that way all along, even if it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. And despite attempting to wing my way through it again, This might just be the worst idea ever. Things just felt off, so I frogged it. I shouldn't have done it, but I did. Everything joins around here, and then I'll insert the zipper on top. The thing with working in the round was that it was very, very incorrect. Not only was the original body knit separately, then seen together at the sides, but switching from front and back to front side only knitting meant changing the lace slightly as well. You might be able to see it here, but basically I'm just SSKing, but previously I was SSKing on the right side and then purling together on the wrong side. It's really not that easy to tell the difference. I do feel like the original right and wrong side is a little bit thicker, but it does the same thing. It was also more difficult to track rows now that the wrong side looked an awful lot like the right side, because it was. I've totally forgotten which side I'm on. I think I'm on the wrong side, which means that I shouldn't, I shouldn't have made the decreases here. Currently, I have some idea, but really, I have no idea if I've done any of this correctly. To make things a little more clear, I'm going to transition from all of that leafy madness to just this zigzag pattern. So why knit in the round then? Well, my reasons were as follows. It just made the most sense. Even though I had to change one lace type, I personally preferred knitting on the right side over alternating every row. Knitting separate panels likely made sense for a machine knit garment, but this way I could avoid the arduous task of seeming such a lightweight fabric. Plus, my own guess is that if this dress could have been knit just as efficiently and economically in the round, it would have been. And let's not forget that this was a dress from the 90s. Lastly, but perhaps most importantly, this way I could actually see how everything fit. So really, it was a no-brainer, despite all the weighing up and the whole predicting the future stuff. Okay, so this is my progress so far. And it does seem a little bit tight around the part that I've just been knitting once I joined in the round. But yeah, let's see. And I think it's looking okay. In fact, I think it's looking good, even. Obviously the back is still open, but it's really stretchy, so I don't think it'll be too much of a problem. I'm actually really happy with how it fits at the front. I was a bit worried that the opening would be a bit too, um, I'm not sure what the word is, like frilly, but not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, I guess the one concern I have now is that the armholes might be a bit big. I actually can't believe how much I like how it fits. I really wasn't expecting this. Obviously I also have to figure out the sleeves and I'm a little worried about the numbers because I really could not see what was going on at all. 
but I think it's looking promising so far and um, it could be worse. It could be much worse. I'm just realizing now that I basically just look like my stand. <gasps> I just forgot to flip my work. No, we're good. Oh, that was um, a shock to the system. The main task now was to shape the body of the dress, and since this was relatively easy to replicate using the references, it was likely the breeziest part of knitting the entire garment. Obviously, with the dress being knit in the round, it wasn't exactly the same, but instead of the seam on the original, I just continued with the purl column where the seam would have been. To switch to a new ball of yarn, I used the clasped weft join again since it was still my favourite and honestly saved so much time without having to tidy the ends. The hardest thing about it is trying to pronounce it. After decreasing, there was a fair amount of straight knitting in the round before starting the increases, so I just decided on invisible increases because, as the name would suggest, they would go unnoticed. And here's the thing, this was not the case and I had been foiled by mere semantics. To be honest, I'm not sure I like them very much. It's hard to see clearly, but these invisible increases totally ruined the tension of the pearl column, which was a lot more fragile and important than I'd given it credit for. As smoothly as this was meant to go in the world of my imagination, that was not the reality, and it would have really helped to sample the increases separately first. And while we're sharing, I did notice this happening, but didn't know how bad it would actually get until double digit rounds later each of which by this point took quite a while to complete. The silver lining of all of this was that picking up the stitches this time was a lot easier than before. So I think it made a bit of a difference, although not as much as I would have liked. Either way, I do think it looks better than before, although it's not that much better. Moving forward, the make one increases seemed to be working, and things were starting to get a little too easy and, dare I say it, a little too boring. But at the same time, I had to remind myself not to take it for granted, because there was no telling how long it would last for. And after feeling confident that this was all going in the right direction, I decided to try things on again, and well. Let's just say that blocking was going to play a larger part in this than predicted, whether anyone wanted it to or not, and that included the wool fibres. I feel like this is like the correct length. You can already see the flaring, but Obviously, it's still quite short, so I think at this point it's probably reaching top of the hip, so like a low waist kind of length. But according to the images, this should be one of my last set of increases, so something isn't adding up. Obviously, there are more increases at the very bottom for the hem, so I think that should make a bit of a difference. But in terms of side increases, this might just be it. So remember that tiny detail about the wool blend being different to the 100% alpaca? This is when it really started to show. The thing with alpaca is that it doesn't have as much bounce or elasticity as wool, and the reason this definitely applies to this dress is because many of the second-hand versions I found online had clearly gotten longer over the years, so much so that I genuinely thought that it was sold in different lengths, until I looked more closely. And this means that one of or both of the following things are true. No one knows how to care for knitwear, or this was completely unavoidable. So here was the dilemma, and before you ask, the slight scratchiness of the wool didn't bother me at all. The biggest problem now was not knowing how much the wool would stretch out after blocking, which meant that there was no way to be sure of how many rounds and rows this version needed to be. According to the images, these should be my last set of increases before the hem, but as you can tell, there's still quite some distance to go. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to continue adding increases. What I think has happened here is that I'm definitely using a different yarn to the original, which probably makes a really huge difference. Other than that, I also have no idea if my gauge was correct. So although the top part seemed okay, that didn't necessarily translate to the rest of the dress because of the lace pattern. So... Of course, on the flip side, things might work out perfectly both after blocking and three decades of wear slash storage because the wool would help to hold its shape better. My other concern is that once I block this, everything will actually fall into place and I don't actually need to do as much as I think I need to do. But at the same time, I don't know if I want to take that risk. But at the same time, I can't really see how this isn't too short. As you can see, it's totally capable and this looks more like it should. So yeah, maybe, maybe it is just a case of blocking. Yeah.
But what it really is a case of is making a decision, and I'm pretty stuck. Did I block any of my swatches? No. Did I have any appropriate swatches to block? No. Was I going to knit a large enough swatch, block it, then measure it? That ship had long sailed off the edge of the earth, which makes as much sense as you think it does. And besides, impeccable logic would suggest that the risk of it not being accurate just meant that it wasn't even worth trying. Truth be told, I ended up adding more increases and length to hedge my bets, but it didn't look right at all, and the measurements were way off considering it hadn't even been touched by my tears, so there was no telling what blocking would do to it. I could continue and it might just be fine, but if it's already on the loose side now, it's going to be on the giant side later, so I think I'm going to frog and just stick to the original and hope for the best, so I'm just going to have to gamble with this one. I really hope I don't regret this. So I began to frog the biggest frog yet. This was a king of frogs, and his name was Frogeric. King Frogeric ruled over all the frog ponds in all the frog lands, because he really was that big, and no other frogs ever grew big enough to defeat him. That was until the day that… well, that would be spoiling things, wouldn't it? So in the end, I decided to go with blind faith and just knit to the same specs as the original, despite using a completely different yarn. Nothing bad ever happened as a result of that before. Eventually, I managed to finish the then current ball of yarn, and although this freed me from a fate I was not yet prepared for, it subsequently tossed me straight into the fires of trial and error. I mean, a trial by fire. What's the difference anyway? That's right, the sleeves. But it's always the first sleeve, and then it's the second one. Why is it never just the one sleeve that miraculously breaks into two through some kind of fragmentation process? I mean, aren't frost flowers some kind of plant? <coughs> Evidently not. Anyway, what was interesting about these, well, not really, was that they too had to be mirrored, and even though it's been a while since the whole ordeal, it still hurts to think about it. Again, bar the flower lace, no charts were used. There's something about picking up the first set of armhole stitches that reminds me of boarding a long haul flight. It's not going to end for a while and there's simply nowhere to go. You can't get up and leave mid-flight and let's be honest, no matter how detailed the map in front of you is, you really have no idea where you are or where you're actually going the entire time. Any break you take will be solely to visit the restroom because you simply can't bear the thought of being perceived as someone who takes deep vein thrombosis seriously or someone who can say it. Not like letting everyone know you have bodily functions is any better, but what are you going to do? The statistics don't lie and neither does the stitch count, but if everyone took it seriously then there'd be no space to move, and then it would be absolute chaos in a tin can at an unfathomable altitude. It doesn't really ever get better. As you probably guessed already, I had to switch back to the cable just to see how everything fits. And I'm pretty pleased with how it's looking so far, but you know, let's just see how it goes. At least everyone has their own screen now. They even have a selection of relatively recent movie releases, a couple of which you've been meaning to watch, but the truth is that given the choice, you'd still rather not. Sure, once you reach your destination, you'll feel a huge sense of relief, but nothing, and I mean nothing, can ever get rid of the haunting feeling you carry at the back of your mind the entire trip, knowing you'll just have to do it all again in just over a week's time. This is exactly what knitting sleeves feels like to me. But I really can't complain, because there's just no other way. Knitting the frost flower lace for the majority of the sleeve was when I started to notice my hands hurting, which is partly why I kept switching needles. It didn't help that I ended up knitting really tightly, and I think this was because I was worried about bagginess, but that was totally unfounded. The real problem was that once I started, I couldn't just switch up the tension midway, and I basically trapped myself into a literal spiral of doom. This took forever, so much longer than expected for how big it was, but after a total of 9 section repeats, it was time to figure out the cuff. I guess it counts as lace, but this was really just a rib with some holes, or rather, eyelets in it. I couldn't find a pattern for it, but it looked simple enough, so I made a 2x2 rib with yarn overs and alternating decreases for the lacy bits. It's not my favourite lace pattern, but I think it's pretty accurate. 
Knitting this cuff was a big contrast to the previous lace, and it felt like the first breath of fresh air after all the recycled air on board the metaphorical flight. I finished the edge with a pico bind off, and that was it. One down, another one to go. Would be the usual thing to say at this point, but it kind of went more like one wrong, two to do. What I'm about to show you is basically the biggest mistake I've made so far. Um, so I was starting on my second sleeve and everything was looking okay until I came across something that I hadn't seen before on the other side. Which made me think I must have made a mistake somewhere. Then I checked my reference images and then I realised that I added an extra leaf. But because everything is mirrored, the stitches just don't line up properly and now I'm basically stuck. Or I just make everything as symmetrical as I can and just hope for the best. I am so tempted to just frog this whole sleeve. Okay, so this is how it's supposed to look. Yeah, I'm definitely going to redo this sleeve. And that's partially because of the way it looks, but also because the stitch count is also completely different now. Starting the sleeve correctly felt harder than the first time, but overall this second sleeve felt like writing a wrong without actually making things right. So the good feelings balanced out the bad ones, and I guess it could have been worse? I tried returning to the hem as a poor attempt at a vacation from the sleeves, but that just didn't last long, and I soon found myself staring blankly at the first sleeve and that pesky extra leaf. I just knew in my heart of hearts that I would not know peace until it was out of my sight. Away with you, Leaf, you irrefutable reminder of my imperfect being and even less perfect perception of three-dimensional reality. I don't know if you can tell, but it is a bit tighter than the second sleeve. So I'm going to redo it. And with the hem, I'm just going to leave it till the end, probably. This was the frog that ended up defeating King Frogeric III, and will forever go down in frogging history. This is the worst thing I've ever done. Finally. Now that my eyes could breathe, I returned to the hem. If this is getting confusing, I apologise, but just know that it was really difficult to maintain momentum and motivation at this stage. So it was time to cast off, and not only did I have no idea if these increases would give the frill hem I was aiming for, I also had to be careful with the pico bind off, just in case it didn't work out and the yarn needed frogging. I didn't want another break. Not here of all places. Already, I could tell that it was taking forever, but eventually there was enough progress to check the drape. <sighs> okay, time's up. That's it. You've taken it too far. You flew too close to the light bulb, but not close enough, and now you have no one to blame but yourself. The increases were in fact too few, and I realised that my human brain simply couldn't begin to compute the true colossal nature of what knitting frills actually entailed. As you can see, it's kind of giving like a spider web effect, when it should be more of like a frill effect. So, although I did the increases right in these places, they should also be here. So of course, I had to unravel everything, and ended up feeling so defeated that I retreated back to the sleeves once again. Now to face the aftermath of the admittedly impulsive frogging earlier. But what is life if not allowing yourself to be driven by every wish and whim? Sure, the sleeves were different in a few ways, but was getting rid of several days' work really the solution? I ask this because for some reason, somehow, starting the sleeve from the top just wasn't adding up anymore. 
Maybe it was the mirroring that was throwing me off. Maybe the leaf did some numerical sorcery on the stitch count. Whatever it was, my regret meter was filling up fast, and there was no control Zing this mess. But I had to stop dwelling in the past, and I could only look to a future with two perfectly matching sleeves, regardless of what it took to get them. And after the final Pico bind off, the sleeve saga came to a triumphant end. And I honestly couldn't have been happier. But only because the other options were just so bad. So happy with this. It was worth it. It really was. Look, I still hadn't mustered up the strength to return to the hem, because the sleeve redo really took it out of me. So instead, I figured it was a good time to reverse engineer the collar. The reason I left it this long was because I honestly couldn't tell what was going on with it, but given everything that had just happened, searching through period laces with very little direction felt like a walk in the park in comparison. And as my luck would have it, I eventually identified the lace which turned out to be the drooping elm leaf stitch. This short but sweet detour was enough to replenish my willpower, and I returned to the hem feeling more certain than ever before, or so I tried to at least. And to recap, this time I needed to double the number of increases, which meant that there was no telling how long it would all take. Round after round of increases later, and I couldn't help but think about how often frills are used to describe things that are pleasant, but wholly unnecessary. And despite how much my hands were hurting, I couldn't have disagreed more. You can really begin to see the frilly effect that's taking place. One change I made was that I switched the make one increases for yarn overs which I think looks better and also fits in with everything a little more. They kind of remind me of the leaves from earlier in the dress, and so I think it was a good choice. I don't know if it's accurate, I think it is, but honestly it's really hard to tell from the reference images that I have, so it's good enough for me. The compounding frilliness from all the increases was intensely satisfying, not to mention that it was really something to look forward to, and there's no taking that for granted. But what the yarn giveth, the yarn taketh away, and it was time to hem the hem. Hemph. So I just finished the last round, and then I counted the stitches, and it turns out that there are almost 600 stitches in this round, which might just be my biggest round ever. Just look how huge this is. Um, I, I guess I better get started. I should probably time this. And so I did. If you too knit and or crochet, then you're probably already more than familiar with how much time flies when you're having fun, as well as how much it drags when you're not. But there's a reason I don't time myself unless I have a reason to, like a knit versus crochet experiment. And that's because confronting myself with the exact number of seconds, minutes, hours that it took to create a couple of inches of something is nothing short of masochism, especially if it needs frogging. Because imagine, just imagine the cornucopia of side hustles you could start with a 4 hour afternoon block. Ever wanted to try drop shipping? You could stuff an entire warehouse in half that time. Print on demand? It's like the most environmentally friendly business model ever. Don't even get me started on self-publishing journals. Now that, that's what the world needs more of. 3 hours, 17 minutes and 46 seconds had convinced me that there is nothing more subversive in this day and age than wasting time. Finally. Obviously, I think there's a lot of blocking that needs to happen, but I definitely think it's more accurate than it was the first time round. So um, all I can say is that I'm glad it's over. And at last, it was time to knit the final feature of this garment. Now I had to figure this one out using the original pattern, since this was a one and a half repetition of the lace. So the top edge was a little awkward, but it worked out well enough. I'd say out of all the laces on this dress, this was my least favourite to knit, because it wasn't that memorable a repetition, and I had to keep rereading the chart, so progress was slow. And yes, to be clear, I did use a pattern for this one. Visually, I liked it better than the cuff ribbing and the zigzags, but not as much as the frost flowers or cascading leaf lace. That said, it was actually a really nice blend between the yoke and the lace columns throughout the dress, so visually and conceptually, it was super cohesive and a nice touch that brought everything together. I finished the panel with my signature Mao Long yarn in for no reason, checked the dimensions and fits with my eyeballs, and got to work on picking up the stitches to begin the Pico bind off. It seemed a little silly to have to create the stitches only to cast them off, but this was absolutely crucial. Skipping it would have ruined everything. Not to be sentimental or anything, but I just had to record the final stitches. It was hard to believe that that's what they were. But 
as of course the ordeal was anything but over because there was no telling if this dress was actually going to be a dress or a top, and blocking was the only way to find out. Running through the options, steaming steamed to be the most sensible option, given that it provided both temperature and moisture, and I could do it all on the stand. However, this was going to be a garment that couldn't be washed all the time, so it was also best to wet block it first, to... Call two nerds with one telephone. And this proved to be the right move, because these waters looked like the tar pits, and if I didn't know better, I'd think it was the introduction to a paleontology special. I blocked the collar separately to mitigate any risks of stretching things the wrong way, and to make sure it was the right length before seaming. The rest of the dress, however, wasn't as easy to deal with. I stretched things out as well as I could on the stand because things were hard to see working flat, but that meant risking overstretching the top part of the dress, specifically the cutout, and that would have been a disaster. I had come too far to be booby trapped at this stage, which ironically is exactly what I was going for, so I let it dry flat first before steaming it on the stand. Steaming the knit turned out to be the most effective blocking method as predicted, so no nasty surprises there. To help with the lengthening, I also pinned the fabric to the stand just above the hem. And that worked really well, but I ended up doing it twice because the hem was still too short after the first time. Once I blocked as far as I could without further compromising the structural integrity of the project, I moved on to seaming the collar. I hadn't given much thought as to how I would attach it, and the mattress stitch was usually the go-to, but the more I thought about it, the less sense it made. I then remembered the three needle cast off, which I'd been meaning to try for a while, and not only did it seem pretty secure, the live stitches were easier to count and keep track of. For full transparency, I left this for as long as possible. Seeming is one of my least favourite parts of any project, and to make things worse, the measured difference between the two edges may as well have been the distance between Mount Everest and eternal damnation. But where there's a way, there's eventually a will. Little known fact, that's the original saying. Another saying is that things will get worse before they get better, which meant that it was time to install the zipper. And it actually went okay despite a few adjustments here and there. Actually, let's not talk about it. Ideally, I would have cut the extra length from the bottom of the zipper, but I forgot how annoying trimming from the top was. Lighters should never be a part of the equation, and I really mean that. Don't do this. And before I knew it, who am I kidding? This took forever. Forget slow fashion, sluggish style is the next stage of this apocalyptic clothing evolution, soon to be followed by Vegetable Vogue, which I'm personally looking forward to. Wait, that happened already? Halloween had come and gone, but in case you hadn't guessed already, that was just an excuse to make this dress in the first place. The original garment was corseted, and since my version is not, figuring out how to style it wasn't that easy. But in the end, I figured something out with a slip dress that I just so happened to have lying around, and a pair of shorts, because this dress was short. Now to see if it was worth it. Despite the extreme blocking, this version is about the same length as the one visible on the runway. Of course, my own measurements have a significant bearing on the fit as well, but at this point, it's almost irrelevant. Things may lengthen over time, but even if they don't, I still really like it as a garment in and of itself, and that's including the micro length. After everything, I'm kind of at a loss for words, but mostly feeling relieved, although it does feel pretty weird to end up with something so close to the original. Of course, there's still the chance that I'll wake up and realise this was all a dream, and I don't actually get to keep it. 
but I guess I'll still enjoy it until then. Was it worth it? Yes, and not even for the dress, but for actually finishing something I would have thought was near impossible not that long ago. Like many before it, this project has taught me that you don't have to know what you're doing to do it, but then again, celebrities teach me that every day. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time with something hopefully a little less extravagant. 